lot of you will know, but it is a beautiful part of the world and it's important that all of you know exactly where we are. Um, it's an, not an entirely abnormal scenario for us to be in, but we haven't been at this campfire for quite some time, so it is great to be back. Previous fireside chats, we've been back at our uh, actual camp where we stay at night, so you got to see a little bit of that. And then last week we were actually following a pair of mating leopards that got chased up a tree by a lion, and it was action that was too good to miss to be sitting around a campfire, so we had to improvise, and myself and Brent out Brent went out together. So I hope you enjoyed that, but also really looking forward to being back here at the original campfire that we usually use. We're out in the quarantine clearings, and it's a beautiful open place that was strategically chosen for the campfire because it is open and safe. Now, enough of the formalities, it's important to introduce Stefan, who has joined us here. A few of you may have seen him from the waterhole camera. He's been here for a few days last week and he just got back yesterday and just to fill you in about Stefan and why he's here he's here to relieve the current presenters and also bring in some of his expertise and knowledge and a different twist on the guiding as all of you would have probably realized by now between myself Mark Brent and even Hayden and Peter we all a little bit different and Stefan's somebody new who can bring in his experience and his experience is really good. He spent 16 years in the industry and Stefan, welcome to the Fireside Chats and I'm um, looking forward to all of the viewers to get to know you and to get to see what you have to, to share out here in the wilderness. I'm looking forward to it as well. Good. Um, folks, I'll, I'll just give Steph this opportunity to run through briefly what he's been up to in the last 16 years in the industry. So. Up to you, Steph. Well, I started a long time ago, as you said, 16 years ago. I started uh, just south of here in the Sabi Sands, actually. Um, did my training as a, a green recruit. Uh, hadn't even been to the Kruger National Park at that stage in my life. And went through a, a training session, which was uh, in itself amazing and obviously set the tone for the rest of my life. And uh, I have to thank all my trainers for that. Uh, and then I moved from the Sabi Sands, I moved into the Waterberg, which is lying just outside Pretoria, and rekindled my love for the bush. It was really a wonderful place to be. The, the fauna and flora out there is just something phenomenal. Uh, from there, I moved back into the Kruger National Park. I happened to uh, move into one of the private concessions inside the Kruger National Park, which is... Well, there's one situated close to Satara, yeah. uh, the Nwaneti concession, and it was there that I really reached the pinnacle, I see it, of my guiding career. I loved working there. You know. And that is really a beautiful concession for many reasons. It's it's fantastic concession. As you'd know, it's one of the most uh, prolific lion and elephant and buffalo areas in the Kruger, and uh, I've got many, many good memories of, of being there. From there, I moved into consulting. I started I had a, uh, I got married and I had a family, so I moved into consulting. And since then, I've been consulting to a variety of, of game reserves and companies uh, in South and Southern Africa and exploring my love for touring. So I've, uh, I've happened to travel basically from Cape Town all the way to Kenya, into Mozambique, and all the way across into Angola. And, uh, I hope to do that for many years uh, to come. But for now, I'm enjoying being back in the northern part of the Sabi Sands. It's, uh, it's definitely different to the southern part of the Sabi Sands. And uh, I'm especially be in enjoying being with yourself and, uh, and Brent, you guys are, yeah. and Mark in actual fact, is yeah. a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Um, for for a, a little bit of our, our history, we actually know one another from a camp that we both used to work for. They've got various lodges throughout South Africa and Africa. And Steph was working at the camp in the Kruger National Park and I was working at the same company's camp here in the Sabi Sands. And that's how we got to know one another. And that's actually a, a, a large part of why I'm sitting here this evening. Stefan actually heard about the position going here uh, for Wild Earth and got in touch with me. He heard I just got back from Kenya. Ah, we've got a visitor. Good evening, Mark. I'm interrupting you. Not at all, not at all. Um, so you would have heard Mark's just arrived and he'll be joining us here shortly at the campfire. 
but my, myself and Steph, as well as Brent, all knew one another. Um, uh, Mark and Steph had yet to meet, but have got a lot in common and are already enjoying one another's company. So we're a, we're a happy team here, and always great to have a new face like, like Steph on board to see what this project is all about. Evening, Marcus. Scott. Welcome. Thank you. Steph, how are you? Welcome. Good. Thank you. So, Mark, um, we just right. yeah, welcome. Another good evening out there. Hello, everybody. Oh, that's a light. This is camera. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes, great evening out there. It wasn't as exciting as this morning, but, but you got you know, spoiled this morning. Oh gosh, <laughs> spoiled rotten. And I think it was so great because it was a Sunday morning. So I think we had a lot of viewers with us this morning that would have been really, really green if it had happened, say, on a Monday morning when a lot of our viewers go to work and, and they aren't able to watch. So I think it was great that we happened to have such like a, what we call in South Africa, like a time. Good. Yes. Good. Well, Steph uh, has just been telling the viewers a little bit about himself and his, his, his history. And we kind of were at the last point of it when you arrived that myself and Brent did know Steph from previous camps that we've worked at. But you guys didn't know one another. And yeah. I was just saying how great it is to have new faces and new outlooks on on the project that that we're involved with oh here. very much so very much so. a completely new angle that, that 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 and also new knowledge new new stuff to share uh, we've already been sharing notes and i've got some stuff that i've already got from stefan about all sorts of things the explanation of scientific names of birds and well a lot of stuff i'm glad i'm looking forward to this, this exchange of information that we're going to be able to engage in over the next few weeks good yeah. great good. And, and, and just so that all of you know, um, you can expect to see Stefan out in probably the next couple of days. He's still familiarizing himself with the area and the project it is very different to regular guiding, which is what we all all are or were before we, we got involved <laughs> with Wild Earth. So he's just uh, getting his uh, bearings here. And in the next few days, you can look forward to a new presenter and somebody else's take on this whole experience. So that is something to look forward to. Um, but yeah, Steph, welcome on board, and we look forward to everything that the future holds. Thank you very much. And welcome back to the sand. <laughs> when, when were you last in the sand? The last time I worked professionally in the sands was in 2006. Okay. So it's been a wow. while since it's I've been. been a while. Uh, although I've come back yeah. on and off uh, freelancing over the years, uh, I haven't been professionally guiding in the Sabi sands uh, since 2006, which makes it so refreshing because... Uh, the south of the Sabi Sands is very different to the north of the Sabi Sands. Very much so. There's a very big dynamic uh, change to the way guiding is approached and um, I enjoy it. It's refreshing. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to my, my arrival back here in 2008. I hadn't been here since I think 96. So it was also quite a large gap and it was also the familiarity because it was the Sabi Sand but it, all, it was also a new area in the Sabi Sand and just this almost like a coming home thing hmm. where there, there, there is that comfort of being here in the Sabi Sand. sand. The lion. Hmm. They're starting to roar at Buffalo's Hook Dam right now. Oh, I wish we were still sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark's, li Mark's lions are, are busy roaring but it's a little bit too far away for our microphones to pick up sadly but we can hear them off in the distance and who knows maybe they'll come closer and we can possibly all of us could hear them if our microphones manage to pick them up my lions yes thanks Scott. well you <laughs> tracked them and found them so today they no, belong I to was, you i thanks though no, that's actually true but i think I, I do owe the credit to lex if i wasn't around he would have followed the tracks and he would have found them i just happened to be ahead of him on the tracks when he had already said they were going that way okay although <laughs> okay, yes, it was, a, it was a combined effort between me and Lex. As it often is. As it often Lex is. Lex and I. Lex and me. Me and Lex. So, just to run through a, a brief outline of what we're going to be up to this evening, we're going to just recap on a few of the highlights because a lot of you, the viewers, cannot follow every drive. So, we'd like to just recap some of the exciting things that we've seen. And thereafter, we're going to field your questions. Now, the beauty of, be, of sitting around the campfire is that you don't actually need to ask a question that's relative to what we're seeing. So it could be something to do with our history or where we've been or exciting encounters that we've had in the past. Now, to send questions through, you would hashtag Safari Live on Twitter 
or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. So send on your questions. Apologies in advance if we don't answer all of them, but there's so many that come through, and we will certainly try our best. But now, highlights, Mark. Um, since you've been back, I mean, we can maybe go from most recent to not so recent because yeah, you arrived well, I suppose halfway I, through the week. I did. In fact, I, I think I've missed a lot, and I'm looking forward to listening to what your highlights were because I've heard you and Brent talking about them, but I haven't really had a chance to catch up properly what you guys saw when I was away. Because my highlights, I think the hi- highlight was coming back. Um, that is always special coming back after a little bit of a break, and because of what we do, it's so much fun what we do. But I think. Several highlights. First of all, I had the I had the Talala breakaways two days ago at Arathusa Dam, and that was phenomenal. They'd killed a kudu bull, and the whole pride was there. Thirteen lion. There are, there are females and nine youngsters of varying ages, anything from about I think nine months or a year to about two two and a half years. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're the they're the biggest pride we get to see at we, the moment. That's right. Yeah. And um, it was only the second time, I think. That it's the only we, thing we, time I've seen them, yeah. yes. And the last time I saw them, we didn't really get to see them very well because I think they were they, they were dotted around. But finally, actually, in the afternoon, the day before yesterday, they actually managed to come out of the, their, their, their sleeping places and they made their way down to the dam and they were all drinking and there was an interaction with a hippo. But they had killed a kudu, so we managed to find, we managed to see a little bit of interaction between them. You know what it's like at the end of a pride when one of them picks up a trophy? And it'll sit there and it'll chew and it'll try and make the rest of them jealous and then, and then it'll get tired and then the next one will come and it'll sit on the side. And it, it, this was the base of the, the horns and that part of the skull. And then there was also just the first cervical vertebra that was also another trophy that they were just sitting and licking and chewing. The other, I suppose, was Shadow's Cub. I didn't get to see her, but we saw Shadow's Cub. And then this morning, what can I say? And this morning following the lion tracks and finding them at the dam and the crocodile was there and then finding just almost bumping into quarantine mail I mean, that's amazing. how many times you actually you because you're looking at tracks or you're looking a little bit further than out there and you actually have a cat right there on your at your feet almost and then finding uh, that karula was seen on her way down towards the dam and we just happened to be heading almost heading in that direction and seeing her stalk, it's always great to see them stalk as opposed to actually finally making the kill. It's very exciting and it, and it is also very, very real about well, that what is happen, that's what happens here. But I know that it is a sensitive thing for a lot of viewers. But mm-hmm. it's nice to see them going into the motion, but not necessarily that executing final, it. Executing it. Um, well, it certainly has been... Uh, a great coming back. Yes. Yeah, you've arrived back at a good time and you've had great drives ever since. Yeah. Um, turning, going a little bit further back before Mark got back from leave. Um, and Brent, just to let all of you know, he is fine and well, but he's offered a wedding. So he'll be back in a couple of days. So that's why he's not here. And myself and Brent got really spoiled together on the same side. And probably the most memorable for me... There was a mating pair of leopards that Brent had spent so much time looking for and eventually in the afternoon they were located and we approached into that sighting. Kirula was in the background so it wasn't just the mating pair of leopards, the dominant male Mvula and a female that we had never seen until this point called Kwatile. And Kirula was hanging around in the background. There was wow. two lionesses that uh, we, 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 we got to a dam twin dams and two lioness poked their heads up there were three leopard approaching the lions chased the leopard up at the, the tree or two of the leopard at least the mating pair and after that all calmed down the lion went back to the dam Karula came down to drink they were looking at one another from across the dam it was all very very exciting thankfully none of the leopards got injured and it is a reality if they do bump into lion that they could get themselves in trouble but thankfully it's not their first time, and they escaped without any problems. But that was a, a very exciting sighting that we shared. We even had a herd of wildebeest back on the property, so not one of the big cats and not one of the stars of the show, but certainly an animal that has provided us with so much great viewing. We actually saw five wildebeest give birth all on this clearing that we're sitting in now. That was in November. So good to have a herd of wildebeest back, a crocodile at uh, Buffalshook Dam, and... 
so much more. A few lion sightings dotted in the way. But so you you had three leopard, two lion facing each other across twin dams. And I thought my dad Biffles looked damn was good. <laughs> yeah, it was a different context. <laughs> it different was very context. different. I, I forgot to mention the elephant. Yeah, yeah. And um, for those of you who, who were watching, there was that one moment we just managed to get there in time. Where we had that male line on the dam wall and the elephant behind it. And if you saw a post from a screenshot yeah. of that, a really wonderful shot for those of you who managed to capture that. And then we had another very interesting sighting with a Tingana, who's another dominant male leopard. And I'll be interesting to, interested to hear Steph's uh, thoughts on this, because this male leopard, who's fully grown and mature now, has managed to kill. This is his fifth aardvark. Now, an aardvark is a nocturnal animal that we seldom see, mainly because they're out late at night. But this male leopard has killed five of them in recent succession. Have you ever heard of a male leopard doing that or seen that in, in your time in the Sabi Sands? You know, male leopard, in my experience, are, are funny things. They, they definitely build their own characters and their own personalities. And depending on what experiences they've gone through, they may or may not like different things. I think the most bizarre about this particular sighting is that he's managed to kill five aardvark. Nine, nine and a half years of guiding professionally in the Sabi Sands, I've never even seen an aardvark. So uh, the fact that he's managed to find five or dig out five is phenomenal. Um, I do know that leopard are creatures of habit, uh, but on an individual scale. So if he's learned how to successfully hunt aardvark, good for him. Because it means that it's an uncontested food source and uh, he's obviously quite good at it. So well done. Yeah. Well, as, as, as Steph said, sorry, Mark, oh. I've, I've spent a third of the time in the Sabi Sands guiding. But I also had never seen an aardvark, and that was until earlier this week when Tangana had managed to kill one. And it was a dead aardvark, but it was my first aardvark in the Savi Sands nonetheless. So what was the sighting like? It was an incredible sighting. We were actually on standby to enter the sighting. He had the kill on the ground, so this is oh, we wow. couldn't see this, but we were nearby waiting for our turn to join. There's only three vehicles allowed at any given point in a sighting, and we were the first in queue as... The, the one vehicle would have left and so we all of a sudden no problem we all of a sudden heard hyena making an absolute racket and what had happened was that hyena arrived on the scene and actually stole the kill from him initially it was a tug of war that we could hear from our vehicle but by the time we got there second hyena had arrived overpowered the leopard and these hyena were busy feeding on on the on the aardvark with the leopard watching nearby a third hyena then came onto the scene and two of them chased the leopard off but had an incredible sighting and again interesting back to habits of leopard we don't know Tsangana very well but he didn't have the kill up a tree now it was at the base of a marula tree it wasn't too big for him to take up the tree but he didn't and again that's interesting how Steph said they're all individually animals of habits and you'll notice that some are much better at looking after their kills once they've made them than others. Very much so, but also they, they do specialize. I mean, you, you, I've, I've known individual leopards that specialize in porcupine, and there are not many that have that. They, there are many that try and give up, and when they see a porcupine again, they give up. But there have always been those few that learn the, the fine art of porcupine cap killing. Um, I just thought we need to dispute the five, though, because when uh, I'm amazed that you've seen it, because it's second, certainly the second time we've had it on camera. Yeah. Um, and when I saw that one, I thought it was the fourth. But I was there. We need to confirm it with 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 the guides, and I suppose some of the viewers, because it was reported by, I think Arethusa and Bencoro guides, and the same sighting was maybe misconstrued okay. as two. So just to clarify that, but even so, it, it, it doesn't lessen the impact of the fact that this is, it, if not his third, maybe his fifth. Mm -hmm. And he's clearly specializing. I mean, I don't know, no, you might not have heard of him. It was a leopard called Mbombi. No. He was an originally born at Londolozi. Uh, and I met him in 96 uh, when I was at Inyati. Uh, he was already 11 years old then, and he was by then, he actually in those days, was one of the oldest leopard that, that, that was around at the time. He specialized in warthog, but he had got down to such a fine art that you knew when you saw him in a 
particular position on a termite mound, it was almost guaranteed that he was going to nail the warthog. Ironically, he was killed by a warthog when he got a lot older. Interesting. How mm. bizarre. I know that uh, in my experience with leopard, at least, especially old males, they tend to uh, hunt warthog a lot. You can almost track them termite mound to termite mound, warthog burrow to warthog burrow. You've seen that a few times. I've seen it a few times. Okay. In, in particular, big, uh, you know, well developed male, male leopard. Yeah. So. Yeah. Good. Well, it's just about time, I think, to start answering some questions. So I'll be waiting for Nikki and the final control to send those through to me. And in the meantime, Steph, uh, it's always interesting to hear uh, a, a new person or new guide's perspective uh, who comes on board here in terms of what you're looking forward to and what differences you may have noticed in, in the short time that you've spent with us. It's a good question that because it's something that I've been reflecting on for for days, you know, preparing for for uh, my game drives here. But I'm really looking forward to spending the amount of time that you spend here with the various cats and the various sightings. I have noticed that you spend a lot of time uh, ex taking time to explain things. And from a commercial guiding point of view, where you've got guests that have been on your car for uh, a couple of days and only have one or two more safaris left. You don't always have that time around uh, sightings, and I think that's what I'm looking forward to most. Um, I'm also looking forward to um, to experiencing this part of the Sabi Sands. The dynamics here are very different. The bush here is incredibly healthy, and um, especially heading into a dry year like we seem to be heading into right now, I'm looking forward to seeing how the bush changes over the next month. Yeah. We're going from April into into May and it's a it's a transition period it's our autumn period and lots of things are going to change so I'm looking forward to water holes I'm looking forward to drainage lines I'm looking forward to a lot of things good good and like Steph says we are all very privileged and that includes you the viewers in the time we do get to spend with the animals because like Steph said uh, when guests come out here for a, a limited period of time, you fin find their rangers having to kind of rush around a little bit to try and show them as much as they can, whereas we have the fortunate situation where we can give you information over a long period of time and make the most of whatever the best scenario is at any given stage. So you're right, and that is something that myself and Mark often chat about and enjoy, and even Brent, who's, who's also a newcomer, so that is something that you will certainly enjoy. I think to add to that, just to, to, to that emphasizes it, that you get to spend time with individuals. And so that answers a lot of the questions. A lot of times we get asked questions about behavior and, and what does a leopard do if or what if. And, and questions that are, can really only be answered by spending time with animals and actually being with the same individual to know what the same individual does in different circumstances rather than seeing so many different leopards throughout a, a, a period of time. Let's not forget that we, we're taking people on safari that have been many dozens, potentially even many hundreds of times here. So uh, that also adds a nice spin to, to the way you do a safari and it challenges your knowledge and it challenges your interpretation of animal yeah. behavior yeah. and um, that in itself is 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 a challenge and it's something I'm looking the, forward the to. Other, as well. The other thing I just thought of is that not many guests on a vehicle have access to Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you can double check us from wherever you're sitting across the world. Anything we say, you can double check us. But I think it's through that that we learn so much. I, I, I've made this statement that I've made for a long time because I've only really studied it in the environments I've lived in and that's vines and the way they grow and I understood, I was all under the impression that they grew clockwise in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise down here because it was all part of the Corollius effect in the whole northern south hemisphere but evidently it's not true <laughs> <laughs> there have been several studies, I think two major studies that have been done on different continents different sides of the equator in different habitats and it seems that mostly it's counterclockwise and it's more got to do with the the, the, the the cellular structure of the plants more than anything else not confirmed that it's the bath water going down on the left or the right 
Okay, so we've got our first question through this evening, and possibly that's uh, our fault for not explaining this in advance, but the viewers are very interested to know your full name and the spelling thereof, and you'll probably find they're going to do some background research on you <laughs> and check up that you haven't been misbehaving. But, Steph, okay. if you could please go with your full name spelling. And the so my name is Stefan Winterboer, and it's spelled S-T-E-F-A-N, uh, and my surname is W-I-N-T-E-R-B-O-E-R. Um, definitely comes out of the old South Africa. I wouldn't say it's the most democratic surname at the moment, but... Uh, it earns itself its fair share of laughs and uh, is definitely a conversation point. Not Dutch or origin? German, in actual German. fact. German? Although my grandparents are Dutch, so, you know, there is that. So, Steph comes from, and that's just a little bit of an interesting difference between, uh, and it's, it's a minor difference, but it is a difference in that Steph's background or, or heritage is of German and, and essentially Dutch descent. Uh, which uh, a lot of the, the people who came into South Africa from the north northern hemisphere were, were Dutch settlers as well as European settlers. So I'm from the European side of things and Steph's from the Dutch side of things. But that goes way back and it doesn't really influence how we treat one another in this, in this day and age. We're all South Africans, I think. That's exactly. <laughs> Very much so. Are we, are we putting anything on this fire tonight? No, we're doing a different dinner are tonight. Are we going to take some cold home? Okay. okay, so um, Steph's getting a lot of questions through this evening, as he should, because there is a lot to learn about him. <laughs> and the viewers are interested to know if you have a favorite animal, and if so, obviously, what animal it is. I have two that share my top spot. I'm very fond of spotted ahina, just because they're very comical, and they're always animated, and they're always doing something. And another animal that I find quite interesting is the honey badger. Uh, obviously because it's also active and it doesn't sleep as much as some of our other predators do. Uh, and they very, they they definitely have a personality as well. They, they know what they're about and uh, can sometimes be quite inquisitive. For their size, they command a mountain of respect. A mountain of respect, exactly, with stories abounding of them tackling elephant and buffalo <laughs> and whatever else they can get hold of. So I would say that those two hold my, my fancy. Um, however, I found that over the years, season to season and year to year, my interests change from birds to butterflies to insects and then to grass and ecology so i definitely say that at the moment uh, my favorites are insects um, although we're going back into winter now so yeah. it's going to change most definitely well mark's got a, a whole library of photographs of insects <laughs> that can keep us busy during the winter because he is something else when it comes to insects there's yeah, nothing better any too. insect that i find crawling around the camp <laughs> I'm like a little kid. I put it in my hand and go up to Mark with a smile on my face and see what he has to tell me about it. So it's good to have another insect lover here. And I'm sure that yourself and Mark and all of us can, can continue yeah. to learn a lot just through and your just archives. The sharing, just the sharing of, of the wonderful thing about the passion that we all share is that it does drive us in different directions. As Stefan is saying, that different seasons, there there are different things that, that grab his attention and... and, and that takes one on a completely different learning path to another person and, and so we are filled with knowledge but it's our own little particular piece of knowledge so to share that with each other because we all build up these little libraries in our head and, and nobody else ever gets to read them as much as say the viewers and the, the best way to learn is to, to what did somebody call it I forget, I think of a term, but there, there was this sort of shared knowledge that, that we need to, and we do, we do. It's like you say, you bring me insects because you want to know and because I want to see because you, you know how happy it makes me <laughs> a, a jewel beetle or a, or a longhorn. Okay, well, we've just got another question through from Jules and Wonder. Good evening, Jules and Wonder, and welcome to the Campfire Chat. I hope okay. you're having a wonderful <laughs> evening. Jules and Wonder are interested in a bird's nest that I found yesterday. It was a very small cup-shaped nest that had been lined with spider webs that the bird would have purposefully collected 
in order to build its nest. And we have chatted amongst one another as to what we think it could be. Mark says the sunbirds uh, will we'll often use spider webs, so it could be a sunbird. And Steph mentioned at first hand a bird called a penduline tit. It's a grey penduline tit that builds a, a very intricate nest with actually a false entrance to with a dead end that naturally predators would see as an entrance, but it's concealed with a dead end. And the actual entrance to the nest is very small and not really noticeable where the birds duck in. And it could have been an old penduline tit nest because it isn't the nesting season. It's difficult to say uh, because it's old and would have broken down a fair amount. They, they would have needed to see the nest, to see the entrance of the nest. But, you know, it's quite remarkable because I've seen sunbirds collecting spiderweb. And you'll often find sunbirds under the eaves of houses collecting cobweb, spiderweb, um, that they will bind with lichen. That's the other thing, whether it was lichen or fine grasses that was used to sow together with the spiderweb. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and you often find them collecting it. But I've had some remarkable things happening outside my front door at home with a, a community spider web and it's happened in two if not three seasons in a row but I filmed it on both two se- or two seasons where they actually they were flying into this community spider's web with bits of mapani leaf and dehusk mapani seed and they were pushing it into the web every day and then of course the spiders would come out and they'd fix it all up at night because they're nocturnal spiders and come daytime the spiders are all this is the only community spider we have here the community web and i'm sure each one of us could be able to find for you find a, a nest for you but these sunbirds were actually building their nest inside the spider web so that they eventually had their ball of the spy of the nest inside the spider web and every time they they modified it the spiders would spin more silk around it it That's was incredible. From Mark. I, f- I took video of it. I need to find it again. You do need to find that and share and that help, with us. help get help editing from Uncle Viam over there. Mm. And the great thing is, for it doesn't matter where you are in the world, uh, quite a few of the viewers kindly researched birds that would use spider webs, and oh. it's across the world. So there was a bird in the in the UK. I've already forgotten what it's called, but also hummingbirds. Uh, that will use spider webs, and I'm sure it doesn't matter which uh, country or area you live in, that there would probably be a bird in that area that uses spider webs. And isn't it quite interesting and bizarre that the birds have become so resourceful to use this resource? Well, if you think about it, you know, bioengineering, what we call bioengineering today, is stuff that is taken from nature. And if you look at a lot of what we think as humans we invented, and you look at what nature has already been doing for so long, it's not a far stretch to think that maybe some human was watching a sunbird or a something sewing with silk. I mean, they're ants that sew with silk. Mm-hmm. They're ants that use silk to sew leaves together. So it's not a far stretch to think that we don't, never needed to sew anything other than when it came to clothing and, and out of necessity. It wasn't an in, built-in uh, action for us to nest or anything. But we've certainly adopted the... The act of sewing things together and I'm thinking well maybe it's because we had people watching nature many years ago before television <laughs> exactly exactly well thanks very much for that question Wanda and Jules and what I'll do is I'll make sure Mark knows where it is and maybe points it out to you and you can go and have a closer look and Stefan where the the nest is and we can try and further look into exactly which nest it is we just got another question through from Jeffrey. Good evening, Jeffrey, and welcome. Jeffrey is interested to know whether, or what our thoughts are rather, on Karula being pregnant. Now, for those of you that don't know, Karula is a female leopard. She's just over 10 years old, and her territory encompasses the camp where we stay. So we do see her fairly often, not as often as we would like to, because she has been moving around quite a lot and expanding her territory potentially. But... There are, there is a potential that she is pregnant. Mark, what are your thoughts? Well, I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm having seen her today, and spent time with her. Uh, I don't know when did you last see her. I saw her last in the sighting with the mating pair at about, night. About a, about a week ago. Yeah, maybe. about a week ago. <coughs> um, I was following her through the grasses. And it was only when she was out at the dam much later on, after we left, after we, we signed off, she was standing, as she, as she made her way down to the water, so unobstructed, and I had a look, and I would say yes, 
Not yes, she's pregnant, but yes, I can see her tummy's hanging a little bit. She is an 11 year old cat, so she is going to have, she's had five, lit five litters, so she is going to have a little bit of sagging in the tummy. But it is hanging, there is, yeah, maybe, don't know. Yeah. I can't say for sure. Um, it would be nice to think so. My, my, my guess. I was sitting in final control watching your game drive today and with the benefit of having a recorded scene and something that I was able to refer back to, yeah. uh, I'd have to confirm that with you. She definitely has a weightiness to her belly that suggests something else than sagging. Mm -hmm. um, or a full tummy. Or a full tummy. She 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 definitely had a meal at some point, but yeah. there was that weightiness that mm. they get. Uh, and it's nice so, to have a fresh so perspective yeah. that's not tainted by the fact that he might not, Steph might not know that she lost cubs about three months ago, to the day. Four. When was it? End of December. Middle, wasn't it? Somewhere yeah, in December. Mid, mid to late December, but let, let's call it January, three February, months. March. Three and a half months, and their gestation period is just over three months, 90 to 100 days is, is a figure that is used. So the fact that she did lose her cubs, and leopards are known to mates very shortly after losing cubs, not every time, but potentially a week or two after losing cubs, mm, they could already come into season come into and, and mates again and have the next litter ready in essentially three months so we are getting to that point that if she had have mated shortly after she lost her cubs we should be expecting cubs fairly soon but uh -huh. steph didn't know that so it's nice mm -hmm. that he's yeah, no i wouldn't i wouldn't push it to say soon i'd say that there might still be another another good it's only the first bit of the first trend. trimester yes maybe still about two months to go when was she when was she mating well she hasn't been seen officially that we know of mating since then but I know it was a week or so after she lost her cubs that That's I right. found tracks of a female leopard that not necessarily was her, but in all likelihood could have been her with the male. So already she, there was tracks of a female leopard in an area where she moved, so we can assume it was her. Can't be sure, but there's a strong likelihood that she could have already made it. But it was that time that you found that, that she had that, the, the impala killed the baby, she killed the lamb, then yeah. she killed the adult, and she was in the big jackalberry on Gary Cutline, and I, th I, I think it was quarantine that was with her, but Mvula was also in the area, which might account for those tracks that you saw. Yeah. Um, it's a wait and see. We've got a couple of more weeks. Let's, let's, let's take note of it. Yeah, and I, I took some photographs today, so I'll put that on her site on Facebook. I'll put it on. I'll I'll, I'll do it tonight. I'll I'll try and get that sorted out this evening, so that everybody can have a look. We might even get a veterinary opinion from somebody out there. I know we have a vet tech that watches, and he might be able to tell us a little bit more. So it'll be nice to know, and it'll be nice to watch. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. Uh, Rather than guessing, let's let's notice the difference. Let's let's take note of what she looked like today, and we'll be seeing her empty-bellied. We'll see her full-bellied, but there will be that one telltale thing, which will be that little bit of a pouch underneath her. That yeah. all the suckle marks around it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that that that's a, that's a little way away, but that's going to be great to be able to see. But Jeffrey, it certainly is something to look forward to, and as you would have gathered, we all feel that she could be pregnant, but can't be sure. And it's just a waiting game from now. Now we've got a question through from Joanne. Good evening, Joanne, and welcome. Hello, jo Joanne is interested to know if we've had any sightings of any animal that has kind of got us thinking or, or, or questions our thoughts on their behavior. And because I heard the question ahead of you, I'm going to start the ball rolling here with an answer, and I'll let you two guys <laughs> think about it. Um, there are always interesting things that happen, Joanne. Um, the thought that it initially came to mind for me was something that happened quite recently. We were sitting at Buffalo Dam, where you were all with Mark this evening, so a familiar place to all of you. And we were watching elephants, and there was a lot of stuff going on. It was a great sighting. And then all of a sudden, a woodlands kingfisher started flying and, and landing in the water, which they're not supposed to do. They sometimes kind of fly and do a crash landing, but after a split second, they fly out, and that's how they'll get their body dry. They're not actually hunting fish, 
but they're actually getting wet in order to clean themselves, not dry wet, to have a little bath, but it's usually an instantaneous in and out. This bird, however, was flying and landing and opening its wings and floating, basically like a duck, and it was behavior that is unexpected, and, and most people that I've spoken to in the industry have never seen anything like it, so you do get these unique scenarios of, of animals doing things that technically they're not supposed to do, which is always wonderful to see. Um, this was a young bird. We could tell that it was a juvenile because of its, its beak coloration. So maybe it was young and adventurous and who knows, maybe a little bit silly because floating around in a dam, which now has a crocodile and it didn't at that stage, but even the terrapins could pose a threat and, and, and latch onto that smallish bird. So maybe it's the fact that it was young and a bit naive that it was taking these chances floating around in the dam, but it was interesting behavior to see nonetheless. And, and kind of inexplicable, we didn't know why, or we couldn't ask the bird why it was doing that, but it certainly seemed to be enjoying itself. Yeah. Don't think I've seen that before. Yeah. Me either. But to try and rationalize it, I suppose, would be a, 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 a starting point. And I would have to say that immediately I want to jump to the conclusion of it's been really hot for the last couple of days and dry. And birds really battle to maintain a constant body temperature. And you might find that he was just cooling himself off, uh, soaking the belly feathers. They're quite absorbent, uh, getting the water onto the skin and then uh, flying off yeah. on one of these uh, windless days that we've been having out here. So that would be my take on what he was doing yeah. without and, seeing it. Yeah, and Steph is on the money there. It was a very hot afternoon and I was even tempted to try and pull off the same stunt as that kingfisher that <laughs> afternoon and go and flop, flop around in Buffleswick Dam. So you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> so Although, not advisable now. Yeah, not advisable now that there's a crocodile and two lions and a herd of elephant the last time we were with him. <laughs> exactly. But uh any anything that comes to mind for you I've guys? I've been thinking while you've been talking but I've been interested in listening so if my brain was listening <laughs> to you then thinking about I'd, I'd have to think about it. I'll probably come up with something at the most inopportune moment while you're already talking. But Whenever I, you're ready, Mark. <laughs> I, I, offhand, there's always things, you know, behavior, animal behavior is probably one of the most fascinating things of all. Because it is so undefined, it is so random, it is so unique. Every time you watch something, you're going to see something different. Um, but yes, to see something so out of the ex out of the ordinary, I, I, I have to think about that. Yeah, fair enough. It's a good question, Joanne, and I got lucky. Initially, I thought, oh, how am I going to answer that one? <laughs> and it, it is it is a good question, though. I might just chirp in the middle of a drive one day. Oh, the <laughs> Well, exactly. So, Joanne, you've got to stay tuned for Mark's answer. He's going to, going to give it to you at some stage. Maybe not this evening, though. Steph, anything from your side that stands out, <clears throat> something interesting that you were surprised by? I quite enjoyed seeing the footage of the crocodile eating the tilapia in the dam. I have seen crocodiles using elephant um, to fish. So as the elephants move into the dam, they kick up a lot of sediment and fish okay. use the opportunity to, to feed. And I have seen them catch fish before, but I've never seen them catch a tilapia that size. Yeah. In was it a big one? It was a big one. It was yeah. fairly big. Yeah. I mean, like, I only <coughs> saw the footage of it, so yeah. I would judge it was probably... Yeah that uh -huh. big yeah. um, but I've only seen them eat catfish like that I've never seen them catch tilapia like that and that's a good point that Steph's just raised and the, the beautiful thing about having a few different minds around one campfire is that when we were watching the buffalo drinking we were speculating as to whether we thought this crocodile may take a, uh, an attempt at a small buffalo which it certainly would be able to catch provided the situation presented itself to the crocodile and the crocodile was disappearing and eventually it would pop up and we'd see it again. And at one stage it was right in and amongst the buffalo. It was actually encircled by buffalo. And it could well be that it had gone in there, not necessarily to look for a buffalo, but to look for the fish that have all been attracted by the buffalo's hooves that are kicking up all the dirt and sediments and insects that may be hiding below the surface. So that has helped me and I'll piece together, together the puzzle. And it could well be that rather than the crocodile going for the buffalo, it was attracted to the <coughs> movements around the buffalo knowing that there would be fish there. Opportunism. 
Exactly. Yeah. The drongo catching insects around the alleys too. And there, there's so many things. Um, but yeah, thinking of, 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 of sort of footage I've seen of unusual behavior, but I think it's every day that that we we spend here, we're hoping to see that one thing that we've never seen before, to be able to, and it is, it does happen every day. Oh, with understanding comes more questions, I yes, found. You very know, much so. Okay. Well, thank you very much again, Joanne, for getting us onto that topic. But we are going to ask the next question now, and that's from Carla in Holland. Good evening, Carla, and welcome to the campfire with us this evening. Carla is interested to know... Oh, I've just gone blank. Nikki? <laughs> Nikki's going to send through the question again, but I've just gone absolutely blank. Ah, oh, the radios. Okay. <laughs> Apologies, Carla. It's a great question, though, and I shouldn't have forgotten it. And this is we all going to enjoy, and I look forward to hearing everyone's answers. Carla is interested to know the radios that we use during our game drives that we all coordinate with the other game viewers where the sightings are we work together to find animals would you prefer to drive around without the radio or with it and now there are pros and cons which we can all go through but we'll 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 start with mark okay. if you like well i think having experienced both um it, it, it's very intense here in the sabi sand to some degree it was perhaps the most intense I've ever experienced it in Thornybush. And I don't have a radio at home, although I have neighbours that all have radios, and, and it's a very big share block next to me. That there's a bar now mm -hmm. shouting, by the way. Um, but also in East Africa, <coughs> where we've been, we're the only people there, so there, there are no radios, there are no other vehicles, and or even out on a walk. When I, I mean, Out on a walk, there is no other sightings to go to you're out there in the wilderness and you're doing your own thing i have to say that has to be the best mm -hmm. because that is where you're able to experience anything whether it is an impala or a giraffe or the most incredible sighting that some of the ones that we see you're the only one that is ever going to see it and it's that uniqueness and that 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 moment in time that is only yours and even if well, no, there's no one to share it with. That's, yeah. For me, that's the thing. It n doesn't necessarily work for what we want to do here because I think there are far too long periods when you're not seeing much, when you've got to full time with things that are not easy to do with the camera. Yeah. So for your own personal enjoyment, and we privilege privileged in that we've spent a lot of time in the bush, it would be great to have absolutely no idea what's going on and everything's a complete surprise. Definitely, definitely, like Mark says. But at the end of the day, if we didn't work together, <laughs> we would really battle to find animals. And all of you that, especially that have been viewing for a long time now, you'll know that one day we're the lucky ones that get to find the animals, but other days we have to rely on the other people to find the animals for us. So it's important to yeah, share. It's like those moments of going over to Arethusa and, and joining in on the sightings in Arethusa, if it wasn't for that. We wouldn't have seen those, uh, the salar, oh, sorry, the, the breakaways. Exactly. Steph, your thoughts? While I can't dispute the, the fact that being alone in a sighting has a particular magic, uh, the very big pro of having a greater guiding community helping you on any one game drive is that you have choice. You can choose what to see, you can, mm -hmm. you can choose, uh, how you build an experience basically and and uh and well that that is a that is a key thing uh, because people are here for such a short time to build an experience for them because if you very much so yeah sorry yeah so you know while i have while i love being in sightings that you track and find and view on your own there's definitely a huge plus to being part of a a, a, a guiding network. community that works so well uh, as it does here. Yep. So, and if it wasn't for all of the vehicles and all of the people spending time with the various animals that we occasionally get to spend time with, those animals probably wouldn't be habituated with the vehicles and the quality of our sightings would be far worse. What you need to remember, especially in this reserve, is that people have been coming here for over 50 years 
just armed with cameras, taking photographs of animals and not interfering with the animal's day-to-day -day routine, allowing us for the incredible sightings that we have and the proximity that we can get to animals, especially leopard, I would say, yeah. the main one in this area, that are naturally very shy and elusive, and you'll find them in other parks throughout Africa, but you won't necessarily see them there. They'll occur there, but they will not be relaxed with humans. So that is a perk of having lots of people sharing information, tracking animals together, and then just the fact that even if we're not responding to a sighting, mm. we know of something interesting that's happened far away from us, that Karula has arrived in an area where we wouldn't expect to have, but because people are there driving around and looking, we get to know that interesting information about the animal's movements even when we are not there. Yeah, or we can anticipate them coming here and hearing about sightings elsewhere and knowing that, well, where they're close or they're makes a difference yeah makes a, a huge difference. difference interesting question though that was very yeah. interesting yeah a good question and i'm sure a lot of guides would have never-ending debates as to <laughs> what the correct answer is to that okay we do have the next question coming through though so thank you very much for that question though Carla. okay Lynn in Canada, good evening, and I hope you are well. Lynn is interested to know what has been our most hair-raising experience to date. So I'm not sure if any of you would like to start with that. If you're not ready, I can. Go right ahead. Are we limiting that to here? Um, yes, let, let's... Uh, to Juma, or... Well... If Lynn wouldn't mind, should we limit it to the... No, let's let's keep it open-ended. Let's keep it open-ended. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with... There's varying degrees of hair-raising, but I'm going to go with an interesting story that got my shackles up, and that was actually with the snake. So occasionally, in and around the camps, you find snakes, and if they're inside one of your guests' rooms... Typically, you need to try and remove it, understandably. So, it was here in the Sabi Sands, the southern Sabi Sands, where there was a, a Mozambican spitting cobra. They are not the, the biggest of cobras, and probably get to the biggest I've seen in this area, about a meter and a half in length. And you, thankfully, they're not deadly for an, an average healthy human, but they do pose both a, a very nasty bite that would probably get you into hospital, as well as the fact that they can spit venom into your eyes. So I'd been told that one of my guests had a, Mose or a snake in their room, so I went there. We've got a big visor and snake catching equipment, tongs that are speci specifically designed to catch snakes. The problem with these tongs is that they're designed to catch snakes out in the bush not necessarily in closed environments. And I was finding that with the right angles on the walls that the snake was slithering down, these tongs actually didn't have the right grip or, or, or shape to lash onto the snake. And it was after 10 or 15 minutes of some... ...thing definitely was with the snake. And the interesting thing that I think we can learn from this is that if and when you can avoid catching a snake, which is the majority of the time unless it's inside your room even then what we could have done if we weren't under pressure is simply open the doors and the snake would but where you can avoid catching snakes or call somebody that does have the knowledge and the right tools to do that because you'll find that most people get bitten by snakes when trying to either catch them or kill them yeah, yeah. so um, that's my story and I'm going to hand over now to Mark and Steph, I'm not sure which one of them is ready for their hair-raising story. <laughs> I don't know which one. <laughs> um, I suppose I, I had an elephant encounter that was pretty hair-raising because she was beating me up and she gored me with her tusk and I was fighting back for my life. So you were on foot then? Yeah, you know. And I was underneath her, so that was that was pretty hairy. I've had the cobra and rolling a landy, and I've had a few other events in the bush, but I think the worst has probably been underneath an elephant. Okay. 
So Mark's probably Trump's mind because but, um, I it's haven't. Not a Trump thing. <laughs> no, it's not a Trump thing. It's different genres. Hmm. Different genres of hair raising. But Mark's Mark's one was a much larger mammal than my fairly small reptile. <laughs> <laughs> Although I must be honest, I think um, most guides have their moment with elephant. It's sort of the watershed moment between uh, being a bit uh, too brave and then learning full respect for elephant. You know, they complacency. They plays a bit of a role there too they do my closest encounter or my ha- my most hair raising encounter was with elephant as well um, a male elephant I stumbled upon him on a walk with some some people and uh, bef- we were looking at some tracks and he was walking down the road and before we knew it we were well within each other's comfort zones he wasn't comfortable with us and um, we definitely weren't comfortable with him but the usual trick of just creating distance didn't work and he decided to chase us away from where we were and the unbelievable build up of tension was actually what uh, what scared me the most was this this groundswell of pressure that you feel when an animal's rushing down at you mm. and uh, at the most critical time my group of people that I was guiding split apart and bombshelled into oh. the bush around me <laughs> so uh, it was a choice between running myself uh, protecting the only person that I could which was next to me and having this unbelievable sense of responsibility <laughs> for those who are um, bombshelling or bombshelling <laughs> and uh, even though nothing happened the elephant stopped and I managed to jump off the edge of a drainage line into some sand uh, it was still to this day it raises goosebumps just thinking sure. about it, you know. Oh. So. Yep. so, definitely elephant is what I want to say. There is something about a big bull rushing, even though 99% of the time they always stop. But yeah, rushing up and kicking sand in your face. <laughs> exactly. And just standing your ground and not knowing what, whether he's going to stop or not. Yeah, well, there certainly are a, a long list, and we would have to have a gigantic pile of wood here to go through <laughs> yeah, we'll all of the other hair-raising moments. But it is something that keeps it real out here. There is obviously risks, but what's important to remember is that it's far safer as a human being here living in the wilderness than living in any city in the world. Oh, yes. And, and <clears throat> all of us will, will vouch for that. So even though there are risks here, they are are not nearly as as numerous as those risks where there are more humans than animals. So I feel safer here than anywhere else, and even though we do get the odd fright, typically animals do not want to have anything negative to do to us, and it's very seldom that they do. Well, it is the time time to wrap up the, the fireside really? chat already. Um, it gets diluted when, when we've got extra guests and visitors <laughs> and the time goes by and we've got great questions coming through. So thank you to everybody for your questions that you've sent through. And sorry we couldn't answer everyone's, but we, we, we always try and try, try, try our best. And send your questions through tomorrow on the drives. That is also a good time to send through questions. And from myself and Stefan and, and Mark... Thank you very, very much for joining. And again, a big welcome to Steph. We can't wait to get him out on the road. And it'll just be in a couple of days until you see him and get to go on a game drive with him. And I can guarantee you you're going to have a good time. So that's something to look forward to. Also, Brent will be coming back sometime this week. So there's going to be a lot of action here and a lot of new faces for you to see. And and we're working on Jigger tomorrow. And we're working on Jigger, the other vehicle, tomorrow. Obviously, it's the weekend. So we couldn't convince any mechanics to come out here and do the work but it's not a problem because parts are being sourced in Johannesburg as we speak that need to be put into the car tomorrow so hopefully tomorrow afternoon or the next day we'll have the second vehicle up and running but other than that I wish you all a wonderful evening or morning depending on where you are in the world and thanks, thanks to guys. Steph and Mark and to VM and Andrew on camera thanks guys to Nikki and Final Control, and there's also another member of the Wild Earth team that a lot of you will know. His name is Will Fox. He's also back here for a short time just to give some inputs on our project and how we've been doing. So it's great to have Will back in camp, and he's, he, he, he just arrived today. So 
It's a big crew here. And from all of us, thank you and good night. Bye, everyone. Great to see you.